Without the ones like you, who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional grade industrial supplies. Count on real time product availability and fast delivery. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Hold your ears, folks. It's showtime. People pay good money to see this movie. When they go out to a theater, they want cold sodas, hot popcorn, and no monsters in the projection booth. Everyone pretend podcasting isn't boring. Turn it off. Hey folks, welcome to a special episode of The Projection Booth. I'm your host, Mike White. On this episode, I'm talking with Jared Stearns. He is the author of the new book, Pure, The Sexual Revolutions of Marilyn Chambers. The book is available right now, starting April 22nd, 2024. Get it on paperback, get it on Kindle, just get the book. It's a great, great read. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the interview. Jared Stearns, tell me a little bit more about yourself and how you got into writing. I went to school for writing. I went to Emerson College in Boston. I grew up on the East Coast. And I went to school for print journalism in the early 2000s, right when print was completely dying. So I thought, hey, let's get into print. And so I was a reporter for the Boston Globe. And I was on the night cops beat, which means I was a crime reporter. It's a very cub reporter position. So I had the 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. shift. So I went to many murder scenes. That was a a lot of fun. And then I moved to San Francisco in 2004. So this is my 20th year in San Francisco. I didn't do much writing when I first moved here. I fell into marketing. So that's what I've primarily been doing for the last uh, years. I won't say the the number, but and I've always had a, a, a passion for pop culture. And this book, this biography about Marilyn Chambers just spun into something that I had only dreamed about. So it's been quite an adventure. When was the first time you remember hearing about Marilyn Chambers? I was about 13 and I went snooping in my grandfather's dresser drawer for adult material and being a hormonal teenager, uh, just instinct led me there. And I found it in the form of a VHS tape, and I knew it contained adult material because why else would he hide it under a pile of sweaters? And on the spine was, it said, Marilyn Chambers' Private Fantasies Number 2. And it was part of a, I didn't know this at the time, but a six direct-to-video series that she did. So this was the second one that came out in 1984 or something, but I watched it in the early to mid-90s. So. My grandparents weren't home. I turned it on and watched it. And I was immediately taken with her, not sexually attracted to her as a gay man, but very drawn to her star quality. She had a very palpable star quality, even through videotape. And then I would hear her name referenced on television shows in the 90s, usually as a punchline. But it occurred to me even then Not only did I take a perverse satisfaction in knowing who she was when I wasn't supposed to know who she was at about 13 or 14, but it occurred to me then, wow, she must be really famous for her name to be bandied about so freely in pop culture and to have people know exactly who who that was. And it also occurred to me that was really strange or was and is really strange for people primarily known for adult films. Even today, there are only a handful of household adult film stars. So fast forward to 2011, I was living in San Francisco, and San Francisco was known as the smut capital of America, deemed so by the New York Times in 1970. And this in New York, mostly San Francisco, was where hardcore films, both gay and straight, were made. This was the the epicenter for a lot of 
what would become the adult film industry. Back then, you had to go to a movie theater in the 60s and 70s to see an adult film. And a museum here called the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts did a retrospective of films made in the city in the 60s and 70s. And I went purely out of my fondness for Marilyn Chambers. I saw an ad in the paper and they closed the series with a, a film called Resurrection of Eve, which is a film she did in 1973. It's the one she did right after Behind the Green Door, which is the one that made her very famous. With the Mitchell brothers, it was made here in San Francisco, just down the street. I live in the Tenderloin, so it's just down the street. The O'Farrell Theater, which is now shuttered. And I don't know what happened in the theater, but something happened where I was just taken. Uh, again, it was like that experience with the VHS tape low those many years ago when I was about 13 or 14. So I don't know what it was, but I just said, wow, I have to find out everything I can about her. And I, because I've always had an interest in pop culture and film in particular, I've just known to follow that. I That gut feeling, I don't know where it comes from sometimes, but I've always known to trust it and follow it. And I'm glad I did because now I have a book that's coming out about her. So I'm glad I didn't ignore that one. Mm -hmm. When was the first time that you met her? I never met her. She passed in 2009. The 15th anniversary of her passing was just a few days ago on the 12th of April. It's now the 16th of April. So I never had a chance to meet her. I feel like I know her. I became friendly with her daughter. She had, had one child and her daughter lives in the Bay Area. And I became friendly with her daughter, McKenna, about five years ago when I proposed doing this biography. And that was after years of research as a fan. But to answer your question, no, I never met Marilyn Chambers. I know it had to have been difficult because there are so many stories I'm sure that are out there that are just full of bunk. And probably even her own stories were a little gilded, let's say. How did you start to pull through that and start to dig at the truth? She wrote a book, wrote using air quotes, in 1975, it was an autobiography. They called them erato biographies because a lot of adult film stars were doing them at the time in the, in the early, only in the 70s. And she was only 23, so she didn't have a life story, but it was a cash in. And when you read it, there are three very distinct voices. There, there's her voice. There's the voice of the ghostwriter, whoever that was, or the editor or editors. And there's the voice of her husband manager, Chuck Trainer, who was her second husband and was previously, he was previously married to and managed Linda Lovelace, who most people know. And she was in the film Deep Throat, which everyone knows, even if you haven't seen it. So uh, because I had done some, some research or a lot of research, I was able to discern her voice as opposed to the other voices. And fortunately, she gave hundreds, if not thousands of interviews in her lifetime, both to the adult press and the mainstream press, print, television, you name it. There were plenty of resources, primary sources to choose from. And then there was the treatment of her unpublished memoir, which was never sold to a publisher. But I it got a copy of that through her daughter and it was about a 30 page treatment that she wrote with a ghostwriter. And even then you can tell some of it is her and some of it is the ghostwriter, but I had to be very careful about what I said and mostly put it in her words. So when I say careful about what I said, if there was something that seemed a bit, what should we say, hard to believe, I tried to back it up with several sources or uh, other people or friends and family who I talked to who would say that never happened or yes, that absolutely do, did happen. How many people do you think that you spoke with for this? I spoke with maybe about 30 or 40 or so. So many of them have passed. So that's the thing. And the Oddly enough, the people in the adult entertainment industry who knew her, the ones who are still around, were more than willing to give their time and were so gracious in 
speaking about her. I did get a few people. I got some hard no's from some uh, rather well-known names that she was associated with. But I even got some no's from people who she worked with in the mainstream industry, whether it was music or film or television, who um, apparently they've kept that part of their lives hidden from their friends and family. And they said, I really don't want to talk about my association with Marilyn Chambers. And we're talking a half a century ago, and they're still ashamed by it, which I can't force them to talk. And that's their loss. And I, I hope that they're able to reconcile whatever demons they have. But it, so I got a few of those, too, which kind of surprised me. But most people were willing to talk. Oh, who? in your opinion, was the best person to talk to? Her daughter, yes. McKenna was able to humanize Marilyn in a way that no other person was. But her mom passed when she was 17 years old. And then her father died about six months later. So she lost both of her parents by the time she was 18. So she didn't get a chance to ask a lot of the questions about her mom's career. Her mom was very upfront about what she did unapologetic about what she did and also said, if you have any questions, ask me and became McKenna's girlfriend's go to when they had a question about sex or boys or their bodies or relationships. She would take them into another room and candidly talk to them. So she was very open about that. McKenna was definitely able to humanize Marilyn, but I spoke with Marilyn's brother and sister her brother just passed a couple of weeks ago, but they were six and five years older, respectfully. And by the time Marilyn was 12, 13, they were already out of the house and they were living their own lives. And this was in the 60s and 70s when people got married a lot at younger and had families a lot younger. They were doing their own thing. And but they did have some wonderful stories some pretty jaw-dropping stories about Marilyn and Chuck in particular from Marilyn's sister. And Marilyn's, I also spoke with a, a few of Marilyn's childhood friends, people she knew since kindergarten. Liz Boyd is one of them. And her closest friend of the last 25 years of her life, Peggy, who was became not only Marilyn, sort of Marilyn's de facto manager, but also her not just her best friend, but her manager and had her business dealings and was also the spokesperson for the family when Marilyn passed. So she was able to shed some light on a lot of the post Marilyn Chambers era parts of her life after she she was always famous, but after she after her peak period as Marilyn Chambers, her childhood friends and her brother and sister and also her daughter were the the ones who were able to give a, another layer to Marilyn that she, even she herself, did not let the press or the public see. Mm -hmm. How about all the interviews that you're talking about? It feels like you must have spent a lot of time at the library. Yes. Fortunately, everything's online now. And of course, during COVID, so many things were shut down. But yeah, I did spend a lot of time at the library, mostly for this was even before the biography became a thing just for fun. That's how much of a geek and a nerd I am. <laughs> I would go and even use microfilm and microfiche. But I went it, not just in San Francisco. I went to Las Vegas and London and other places that Marilyn had deep ties to. And then the pandemic hit. And fortunately, sites like newspapers.com and ancestry.com were able to fill that gap when everything was closed and we were all indoors. Well, and I guess you could still do interviews that way as well. Yeah, I was still able to do interviews. One of the interviews I'm proud of getting is the director of Maryland's X-rated films in the 80s. His name is very easily found online, but he asked that he be credited under his stage name is director's name, which is Godfrey Daniels. So I've respected that because 
he never spoke on the record before and never has before. And I don't know that he will, but he's in San Diego. And I went to San Diego in October of 2021 and sat with him for several hours. And he had, he was very close with Marilyn and Chuck and shared stories that I'm not even sure he had shared before or in decades. I know he hasn't even spoken with a lot of the adult press about his, not that he's ashamed of his past, but he's moved on to other things. But the reason he wanted to do this was because he loved Marilyn very much. He still has a shrine that he built to her in his office. And he also wanted to do it for McKenna, Marilyn's daughter, because she, McKenna never got to learn a lot about her mom's career. So he was able to share some pretty, sometimes in some cases when talking about Chuck, some horrifying stories. Your listeners will have to seek those out when they get a copy of the book. Speaking of the book, did it change at all for you or, or is the book pretty much what you set out to create? <laughs> the vision is pretty much what I set out to create, which was both I had, when I was looking for an agent and when I, my agent and I were looking for a publisher, we all had the same or my agent and I, we all had the same idea, which was that this is a celebrity biography about a woman in the entertainment industry who happened to do adult films. This is not a book about a porn star. And nor does it argue for or against pornography. Everyone has their own opinions about it, and I'm not there to to change people's minds, but about pornography. However, I do hope that people will, if they come into this with preconceived notions about what a porn star is, that they might have a difference of opinion when they finish reading the book. And the my agent had the same vision. And so did the publisher Head Press, which is based in the UK. We were, of course, rejection as part of the publishing industry. And we were rejected by a lot of publishers. And I wasn't entirely surprised that we ended up going with a UK publisher because when you add the word porn in there, especially in the US, even though this is a classically American story, she was an American. I'm an American writer. This is about a period in American history. So many, this is a country founded on puritanical values that were really deep. And when you say the word porn, that conjures up conscious and unconscious feelings. We were turned down by a lot of U.S. publishers, but Head Press in the U.K., I'm so fortunate to have found them and they were so supportive of the book. And also shared the same vision that I did and my agent did, which is that this is a celebrity biography and she happened to do porn or adult films. That's one of the things, but she did so much more than people realize. And that was one of the main motivators for doing this in the first place was to tell the story of someone who had a really varied career in show business, but also was a pivotal figure in the sexual revolution. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't realize that she had done so many mainstream things, even all the way back to, of course, the scenes were cut, but Alan the Pussycat, no idea about that. Yeah, she had a non-speaking role in the Alan the Pussycat with Barbara Streisand and George Siegel, which was a big hit for Columbia when it came out in 1969. And she's in the film, but and she gets screen time and she got her Screen Actors Guild card because of that film. She did. She was given ten lines. Those were ended. Those ended up on the cutting watch. I, I would love to see that footage if that still exists. But even Barbara Streisand in her recent forty thousand page memoir, where this is a woman who's met world leaders, who's met every president going back to what Eisenhower or Kennedy. Even she name dropped Marilyn Chambers in her memoir which shows the lasting impression that Marilyn had on the people with whom she worked. And even someone as notable and revered as Barbara Streisand. So she did more mainstream projects than X-rated films. When you think of, especially women in adult entertainment today, they do hundreds of films and scenes for X-rated production companies. Marilyn did five feature length films at a time when you could only see them in the theaters and then did six 
direct to video in the 80s, and then three X rated films in the sort of DVD early internet era. So that's not a lot when you compare to someone like Jenna Jameson or even Stormy Daniels, who's probably the most well known adult film star in the Middle East in the US right now, but that's for other reasons. Do you think that was because of the whole Ivory Soap campaign that it became such a scandal that the Ivory Soap girl was making adult films? Oh, yeah. And, and even Marilyn was very honest that when she made Behind the Green Door in 1972, it was it plays like an experimental art film. If any of your listeners have not seen Behind the Green Door, I highly recommend they check it out. N- not necessarily so much for the porn, although that's that's fun too, but it's not like any other X-rated film that you've seen. And we're so used to the gonzo porn and the amateur porn. Anyone can be a porn star nowadays if you just set up a camera. So this had a kind of a plot, very tissue paper thin plot, but it was bizarre. It's very bizarre. The soundtrack almost would be better suited for a horror film. There's slow motion. But the Mitchell brothers who made the film, they were very serious and they took it as art. And they definitely tapped into the zeitgeist of the 70s. So when the film came out in August of 72, it played in San Francisco and it played in some theaters in New York. It came out two months after Deep Throat, which debuted in New York in June of 72. But it wasn't until May of 1973. And that was when Marilyn got a second check in the mail from Procter & Gamble, which is still one of the largest manufacturer, consumer packaged goods manufacturers in the United States. And at the time, and for at least 100 years, their main brand was ivory soap. And the bar soap, the famous tagline was, it floats. And their detergent was 99 and 44, 100 percent pure as the driven snow. Ivory snow was a laundry detergent made for specifically marketed towards mothers because it was very soft for to wash a baby's clothes. And in the late 60s and early 70s, the executives at Procter & Gamble decided they wanted a new face. And Marilyn was selected from hundreds of young models. She was 17 when she took that photo, which if you think of it as, you know, a 17 year old symbol of young American motherhood, but again, generational. And She took the photo, forgot all about it, because they told her in 1970 when she took the photo, it'll take approximately two years to remove the old picture and pictures off the box and put the new picture, your picture on the box. But it happened to come out right around the time as behind the green door. And she got the second half of her payment. And she mentioned this to the Mitchell brothers who were masterful promoters. They knew a good story when they heard one and they knew how to work the press really well. And they had connections not only here in San Francisco, but in New York and syndicated columnists. And they finally sold the story to, I think, the New York Post. And it seems really quaint and almost genteel in a way to think that the model on an ivory, uh, on a laundry detergent box who is also in an X-rated film, would cause such a massive international controversy in 1973, just a half century ago. But it was huge. I don't think people understand, unless you were there, how scandalous that was. Because Procter & Gamble was, again, the symbol of not only Irie Snow was the symbol of, of young American motherhood, but they were a very powerful brand and powerful company in the United States and in advertising. So when they found out that their new model was in a pornographic film, it was shocking. And it made her a star proverbially overnight. But, But today it seems people get famous for sex tapes now. And but a half century ago, that was just unheard of. But the Mitchell brothers and Marilyn rode the crest of that wave as far as it would take them. And fortunately for Marilyn, it took her into a 30-year career in show business. 
But in the end, all roads led back to adult films, for better or worse. What were some of the most surprising things you learned about her while you were doing your research? Because I had done so much research before really committing to this project, I don't know if there's a lot that surprised me about her. I guess it, it was mostly the stuff about her relationship with Chuck Trainer, And they were together for 10 years and be, were still friends after they divorced in the mid-80s. And Chuck was a manipulator. He was, a, in my opinion, a sociopath and certainly a narcissist. And there was a lot of domestic violence in their relationship, both verbal and physical. And that was surprising and surprising in the sense that I, I figured it happened, but I got confirmation from people that it happened, who witnessed it, who saw it. And this isn't just tangential where they said, oh, I heard about that. Yes, these are people who were on set and actually witnessed Chuck hitting Marilyn Chambers. So that part was not surprising, but it was a, a sad confirmation of something I had suspected. When I had a friend read one of the first drafts, he said, and rightfully so, I even knew it when I was writing this. He said, you really have to stop being so defensive of her. And I was not only as a fan, but as someone who I've lived with in spirit for more than a decade, I was very defensive of her place in pop culture, of what she did, of the critics and all that. So I really had to take a step back and not be so defensive of what was said about her and just let those quotes speak for themselves and offer some context. So that was a challenge, but not too much surprising stuff, just a lot of sad confirmations which could be the title of my memoir, Sad Conversation. <laughs> you talked about how when you saw her when you were just a young kid and she struck you, did you ever figure out what it was that made her stand out so much from everybody else? No, I never have. And I, d I don't know that I ever will. And here's a curveball. I don't know that I ever want to. I've, I've had a lot of, in terms of, the gay jeans. I didn't get the musical theater gene or the fashion gene. I got, but I got the divas gene. I love the strong, my strong women. And I've always had them since I was a young kid. When I was three, I was obsessed with Judy Garland. Go figure. So my parents were not surprised. And I've always liked people a bit under the radar. I love the Madonnas and Shares and Gagas and all that, but I like the people that you don't normally suspect as gay icons, but there's a reverence. She was unapologetically sexual. She was forthright. She was strong. And those are things that, as gay men, we sometimes latch on to because we're ostracized. And even though we've made huge strides in the last 50 years since she was famous or burst onto the scene, it's always one step forward, two steps back. And even in the last... 10 years, things have definitely dialed back in terms of rights for the LGBTQIA plus community. So I respect the mysteriousness of the what attracts gay men to to powerful pop culture women. I like the mystery, but I've definitely done the internal work and the psychological work, and I had the receipts to my psychiatrist to prove it. I've done the work to try to figure it out, but I think besides her sexual abandon and her, her joyousness in celebrating her sexuality, she also had star quality, which I didn't have a, a term for that when I was 13 or 14. I now know it as star quality, which is something you have or you don't. And she had it, and I just took to that. With the head press, did they end up doing the layout for you? Yes. They were really great to work with and really easy to work with. And because we share the same vision, a lot, it made the process that much easier. And I don't know how many people on their team worked on it, but Mark, the head of their design team, did a lot of it. So I have to give credit to him. But 
they did the layout. I have hundreds and hundreds of photos in my collection. I've always been a collector since I was a kid. So I love collecting, especially movie posters and ephemera and things like that and movie memorabilia. So I had hundreds of photos of her. That was the hardest part was narrowing down which photos to include because I wanted to, we all agreed, no X-rated photos, nothing hardcore. Topless is okay if it's tasteful. And that's not to negate what she did in adult entertainment because I know that kind of seems, oh, why not put one in there if she did that and if that's part of her story is part of her legacy. But a couple things. One, that wasn't the only thing she did. And two, bookstores won't carry it if a book contains too many X-rated photos or they'll put it, you know, behind the counter. So we were very mindful of that. That was the most difficult part was, and they gave their input on which photos would work, but I made the ultimate decision in which photos went in there. And that was really, really hard. But there are, are hundreds more and I've been sharing some on social media. Private Chambers is the my X slash Twitter account. And but if you go to jaredsterns.com, all my socials are there too. So you can follow and see some of the at least on X. I still call it Twitter. I'm sorry. Sorry. Because I think only sociopaths call it X. Right. And I live right down the street from it, but the headquarters. You can post X-rated stuff or post full nudes. You can't do that on Facebook. I got banned from Facebook because I posted too many topless photos of her because apparently women's nipples are very offensive to the Facebook community. Oh, no, but violence, thumbs up. But yeah, women's breasts are a different story, which is so ridiculous. But yeah, a lot of hypocrisy, which I hope... I also, of course, spoke to in the book as well, because there was hypocrisy then when she became famous and there's hypocrisy now. Hopefully people will at least think about that when they read it. Book is literally hot off the presses right now, but I'm still going to ask this question. What's next? So I have a lot of ideas and I haven't. There are some things I've talked about with my agent. Nothing is firm. I. Um, all the stuff I have working, I can't really talk about because it's not definite, but I consider myself a biographer. I'm part of the Biographers International Organization, which is a wonderful organization. And I love biography. I don't intend to write fiction and I love telling people's stories. So I could see myself doing another biography of another film star. There are a couple of books I want to do about histories of particular TV shows that have never been written about before, and also music groups that have never been written about before. So those are all in the works, but nothing definite right now. Right now I'm trying to enjoy, this is my first book too, so I'm trying to enjoy the the chaos of launching a book with an independent publisher as a first-time author and a controversial subject matter. So it's been a long road, but an enjoyable one. So I'm also just trying to enjoy it. Yeah, you should bask in it. And especially because you did such a good job. It is a wonderful book. I buried the lead there, but I loved the book. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. I, I wanted to know if you had a chance to read it. And if you didn't, I would not be offended because I know you have other things going on. I did read it. I really liked it. The Though I have to say I was so sad because of that reoccurring pattern that you point out in the book where it's she goes in, she tries to do something and she gets hit on or this producer, oh, sleep with me and I'll give you this or Robert Klein. Oh yeah, of course I slept with her. It just all of those things over and over again. I was like, oh my gosh. It, and it just reminds you of just how terrible things were and that they could easily go back to at some point, but no, they haven't changed. There are a lot of stories in there that mirror the Me Too movement, that mirror what actresses go through today and have gone through, especially in light of Harvey Weinstein and all those cases that have come up in the last decade or so, less than a decade. But there was no casting couch in the X-rated world, but there was and is in mainstream Hollywood. And she definitely experienced that. So 
the stories, at least that people knew about and that she spoke about, I included. I'm sure there were others. She died tragically too young, so she took a lot of stories with her and a lot of secrets with her, too. So there are things we'll never know. We'll never really know what happened between her and Chuck Trainer because he had her under his thumb and kept her isolated from friends and family for a decade of her life. And but I, the one feeling I hope people will walk away from, and this might sound strange, is frustrated not so much with my writing or the book, I hope not, but it was frustrating writing about it because she came so close so many times. She had a chance to work with Nicholas Ray, which didn't work out. She had, she did work with David Cronenberg, which is great. And Rabbit, of course, is a great film and she did some of her best work, but she had a lot of chances she almost worked in the film Hardcore with George C. Scott and directed by Paul Schrader. So, so many almost and what ifs. And so it was frustrating writing about it. And again, even that same friend said, you got to stop being so defensive. And one of his notes said, God, can't this woman catch a break? And later on in her story, and it's true, everything she tried, she put her all into everything. But I said earlier, all roads led back to adult films. But that was also one of her gifts. She was good at it. She knew she was good at it. And she used it to the best of her abilities. For that, we we should be thankful because there would be no adult entertainment industry without people like Marilyn Chambers. There was no such thing as a porn star before Marilyn Chambers and Linda Lovelace. And again, whether you like porn or not, we've all seen it. But whether you watch it regularly or not. She was a trendsetter in that way. And also a feminist, even though the feminists of the age didn't really care for her. So a lot of fun stories about Gloria Steinem in there too. Well, Jared Stearns, thank you so much for your time. This has been great talking with you. I really appreciate you having me on. The book is Pure, The Sexual Revolutions of Marilyn Chambers. It's out April 22nd from Head Press. You can order it on Amazon. You can order it on headpress.com. I can go to jaredsterns.com and follow me, all my minions. It's, right now, it's just my mom. Thank you so much for talking. I appreciate it. Oh, honey, feels so good. Oh,